Alarming news emerging from social media companies today about the CAPS pandemic. Twitter and Facebook are reporting they've identified and deleted a disturbing number of accounts dedicated to spreading disinformation about the outbreak. For more on this, we go to our correspondent, Catalina Parks. Chen, these accounts were created by several state-sponsored groups intending to sow political discord, and some individuals are seemingly seeking to gain financial advantages. Violence against healthcare workers and minority populations has been increasing. A recent riot highlights the real danger in these posts. Countries are reacting in different ways as to how best to manage the overwhelming amounts of dis and misinformation circulating over the internet. In some cases, limited internet shutdowns are being implemented to quell panic. Thank you, Catalina. For more on this, we are joined by experts on crisis communications and social media. Kevin McAleese and Sarah Lee. To me, it is clear countries need to make strong efforts to manage both mis- and disinformation. We know social media companies are working around the clock to combat these disinformation campaigns. The task of identifying every bad actor is immense. And experts agree that new disinformation campaigns are being generated every day. This is a huge problem that's going to keep us from ending the pandemic and might even lead to the fall of governments, as we saw in the Arab Spring. If the solution means controlling and reducing access to information, I think it's the right choice. I agree with Kevin. This is a big problem and doesn't even account for the massive amounts of misinformation being generated by legitimate users about the pandemic. But it's not just trolls who are spreading the fake news. It's often political leaders themselves. Who's to judge what's real or not? Would we trust every government to separate truth from lies? I think this is more than just keeping the bad information out. It's also about making sure real public health information reaches the public. News is found from outlets other than social media. News organizations, public health groups and companies need to help people take the right actions to protect themselves by promoting accurate, real information about the outbreak. Okay, for more on this, we're going to get a briefing from our communications expert, Dr. Sell. Global health experts have highlighted that dis and misinformation are wreaking havoc on the CAPS response. Health workers are under attack in a number of locations due to rumors that they are purposely spreading the disease. And response efforts in many places have had to be suspended because of concerns around violence. Pharmaceutical companies are being accused of introducing the CAPS virus so they can make money on drugs and vaccines and have seen public faith in their products plummet. Unrest due to false rumors and divisive messaging is rising and is exacerbating, exacerbating spread of the disease as levels of trust fall and people stop cooperating with response efforts. This is a massive problem, one that threatens governments and trusted institutions. Polls have shown that mis- and disinformation are ubiquitous. At least 90% of the public has been exposed to these messages. At the same time, misinformation messages come from a variety of sources, even government officials. And often, governments are contradicting one another. We know that social media is now the primary way that many people get their news. So interruptions to these platforms could curb the spread of misinformation, but could also limit access to information from legitimate sources. Health ministries around the world are attempting to combat mis- and disinformation by amplifying public health messaging through social and traditional media. But they are being outpaced by false and misleading information. National governments are considering or have already implemented a range of interventions to combat misinformation. Some governments have taken control of national access to the internet. Others are censoring websites and social media content and a small number have shut down internet access completely to prevent the spread of misinformation. Penalties have been put in place for spreading harmful falsehoods, including arrests. Other countries have taken a more moderate approach and have focused on promoting fact-checking efforts and working with traditional media outlets, yet these approaches are limited in scope. Social media companies report that they're doing all they can to limit the use of their platforms for nefarious or misleading purposes. But this is a technically difficult problem, and false, misleading, or half-true information is difficult to sort without limiting potentially true messages. The bottom line is that members of the public no longer know who to trust. Both the misinformation and the measures to control it have led to a crisis of confidence. 
Thank you, Dr. Sell. So here's the policy crisis for this meeting of the board. How can governments, international businesses, international organizations ensure that reliable information is getting to the public and prevent highly damaging and false information to the extent that's possible about the pandemic from spreading and causing deepening crisis around the world? How much control of information should there be? And by whom? And how can false information be effectively challenged? The social media platforms have to step forward and recognize the moment to assert that they're a technology platform and not a broadcaster is, is over. Um, they, in fact, have to be a participant in broadcasting accurate information and partnering with the scientific and health communities <clears throat> to counterweight, if not flood the zone, of accurate information because to, try to put the genie back in the bottle of the misinformation and disinformation is nigh impossible. So flood, flood, flood good zone. information. Okay, others, yeah, Jane. And we do have, I think, a, a couple of strategies that are available to us, one of which is the flood strategy, second of which is relying and informing and equipping trusted uh, sources of information with the facts so they can then pass that on. But we also need to actually think about a technological answer to this. So there is work that's being done to actually create algorithms to sift through information on these kind of social media platforms. Um, and I know that uh, the Gates Foundation and others are funding organisations to work on things like this. Trust in traditional media sources has grown, while trust in social media sources has gone down specifically after the last elections in the United States. So I think one of the ways that we need to approach this is to make sure that we have the right representatives on traditional media networks in order to uh, portray our side of the story and make sure that there, there isn't um, misinformation. Oh, sorry. No, I think a, a complementary uh, tactic too is to to tap faith-based organizations <clears throat> and civil society and other institutions to recruit them also to 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 basically almost at a grassroots level continue to to basically have the integrity of, of the information. Fully agree that uh, this is pure crisis communication and crisis communication today, also social media is part of it. And just to limit or even or even stop social media would create a huge damage. And uh, we should use it, we should uh, get it on our side, we should work together with them and we should try to avoid this mis misinformation. And uh, another topic is, I mean, our, our industry, there are indications meanwhile that we are getting in this uh, social uh, conspiracy theory topic, that we are part of this conspiracy theory, that we are uh, supporting this, that uh, wealthy countries will spread out caps to, to poorer countries. And this is a clearly, clearly thing of social media that could be directed by a clear crisis communication. And I think with the social media platforms, there's an opportunity to understand um, who it is that's susceptible in what form to misinformation. So I think there's an opportunity to collect data from, the, from, from that uh, communication um, mechanism. The second thing is, with that um, ability, we can identify false information more quickly. We are actually uh, receiving reports about um, people trying treatments that are uh, purported to be effective but are actually harmful. And the quicker we, that's recognized and can be, be countered, the, the fewer people will fall susceptible to those things. So, I mean, we need uh, physicians and the medical community uh, really out there on the forefront talking about this. Uh, yeah, got some yeah. important news to share from our, um, our member companies. Rumors are actually spreading that the antivirals are causing gaps, and so um, patients are, are not taking them anymore. And, and uh, this is particularly an area where we have government mistrust. On the other hand, it's interesting because we are doing clinical trials in, in new antiretrovirals, and in fact, in vaccines, and social media, including Facebook, is actually enhancing recruitment. People are going to it, and they're actually seeking information on where they can participate and sign up. Uh, you know, we have um, <coughs> more, more cases in China and also death cases reported. And also uh, my staff told me uh, that before there's misinformation and uh, there's some belief, people believe, you know, this is a man-made uh, pharmaceutical company made the virus. So there are some violations and even, you know, death is because of this misinformation. One of the things we want to do is work with telecommunication companies to actually ensure that everybody has access to 
the kind of communications that we're interested in providing. I think as in previous conversations where we've talked about centralization around management of information or pu public health uh, needs, there needs to be a centralized response around the communications approach that then is cascaded to informed advocates, um, represented in the NGO communities, the medical professionals, et cetera. You mean but centralized be, internationally? But centralized on an international basis, um, because I think there needs to be a central repository of data, facts, and key messages. I think a couple of things we have to consider are, even before this began, the anti-vaccine movement was very strong, and this is something specifically through social media that has spread. So as we do the research to uh, come up with the right vaccines to help prevent the um, continuation of this, how do we get the right information out there? How do we communicate the right information to ensure that the public has trust in these vaccines that we're creating? Um, and secondly, uh, news organizations in some countries are right now um, under a lot of pressure from their governments to provide politically favorable news. Mm -hmm. And so we have to think about you know, this isn't just the United States where we sometimes take the freedom of press for granted. There are countries where the news organizations are owned by the government and how are they um, disseminating information and what do we need to be thinking about? How do we communicate with those governments to ensure that um, misinformation and disinformation is not being spread? Also, I agree on the point on having a, a centralized source of information and a world body that could have uh, garner the respect of everyone. And I think the WHO in this instance might be that uh, source of information. Um, and again, mm -hmm. using the UN networks on the ground in many of these countries um, has a UN presence through its mm -hmm. resident coordinator system. The note to say that some bad actors are actually using social media to spread rumors about specific companies in order to profit from short selling. So, you know, along, of, along the lines of what we've been talking about, you know, uh, this is going to cause companies to come up now to get some of the screen time as well because they need to spread the, the correct information. But one thing we haven't spoken about, and I'm wondering whether it's time to talk about this, is uh, a step up from the part of the governments on enforcement actions against fake news, right? Some, some of us, uh, these new regulations that come in place about how we, we deal with fake news. And maybe this is a time for us to showcase some cases where we are able to to bring forward some bad actors and leave it before the courts to decide whether they have actually spread some fake news. Obviously, you want to work with the private sector and those who are spreading information generally to see that they can bring things down that are in fact lies or uh, you know, false uh, information that's being put forward as a way to minimize it. But having a source, a national source, an international source, other trusted sources, and really guiding everybody towards that information is one of the most effective ways to deal with a situation like that. Great. And yeah. if, it, if it comes back to misinformation on a level of governments, of, of countries, then we need, as Sophia mentioned, trustable international organizations, <coughs> UN, WHO, and they have to come together to get together to spread this trust and to work against this. We I think it's really critical to think about soft uh, uh, power influence, uh, which is other um, influentials who can call up the head of state uh, or um, powerful constituencies within those countries. Uh, we've seen this in the context of mobilizing religious leaders in the context of polio, uh, uh, or specific business leaders where you can soften perhaps uh, a very hard line from government um, through um, less, more stealth um, uh, um, in, in entry points rather than uh, trying to punish them through the international health regulations or something like that societal consequences as well. The world saw large-scale protests and in some places riots. This led to violent crackdowns in some countries and even martial law. Political upheaval became the rule across the globe. The public lost trust in their respective administrations. Several governments fell while others were desperately striving to hold on to power. This spurred further crackdowns. Attempts to control media messaging, originally aimed only at health-related misinformation, became used increasingly to quash political dissent. Economists say the economic turmoil caused by such a pandemic will last for years, perhaps a decade. The societal impacts, the loss of faith in government, the distrust of news, and the breakdown of social cohesion could last even longer.